Good afternoon to you all. My name is Jerry Power and I am the National Head of Sales for Emergence and I will be your host for today's webinar. The webinar series is an ongoing feature of our education initiative to build the cyber knowledge of our brokers and their clients. Over 1300 brokers and clients across Australia and New Zealand have registered for today's webinar. It's great to see so many people interested in understanding how the threat landscape is changing and how tax are being resolved. To put the issue into perspective, the Australian Cyber Security Centre, which is the federal government's vehicle to assist government and Australian businesses recovering from cyber attacks, received over 67,500 cyber attack notifications in the last financial year. This equates to one notification every eight minutes. On top of this, you as brokers are faced with a difficult cyber insurance market where coverage and capacity is difficult to find for some clients. The current cyber threat landscape and insurance environment are challenging for businesses and brokers. Ransomware attacks pose one of the most significant threats to Australian business, while the cost of business email compromise attacks has also increased. Jeff will provide you with more insights on this later. Today is an all emergence production for your entertainment. Peter First, one of our cyber breach coaches, is going to provide you with an update on the current threat landscape as he sees it on the front line. Then our head of claims and incident response, Blake Baxter, is going to share with you his experience on bringing the emergence incident response and claims management solution in-house. As I've said before, I think this is one of the greatest initiatives Emergence has done in the last seven years. Blake will also get under the hood of one of the claims Emergence has resolved recently. The legendary American Jeff Gonlan will share his insights into the Emergence cyber portfolio, which I think you'll find very enlightening. And finally, I'll update you on what Emergence has been up to. So before we start, let's square off some housekeeping matters. I'm pleased to advise all attendees will be entitled to one CPD point for enjoying yet another online meeting. As usual, there will be the opportunity for you to ask questions. Our Brains Trust and CEO Troy will be answering your questions during the webinar and collating some of the more topical questions for the Q&A session at the end. And if you've got no idea what I'm actually saying, don't worry about it, all the slides are in English. Before I hand over to Peter, I want to thank all of you who voted for us in the recent insurance business survey, Brokers on Underwriting Agencies. Emergence have been humbled to have won the Brokers Pick Award again for the sixth time in seven years. This award is given to an underwriting agency which has developed the best insurance solution which incorporates coverage, service, pricing, premium stability, claims and broker support. We are also very proud to have won the Cyber and IT Award for the fourth year in a row. On behalf of the Emergence team, thank you so much for your vote of confidence in what we do and how we do it. Cyber attacks are one of the greatest risks facing business today from a likelihood and impact perspective. We have seen a dramatic escalation in the threat space over the last six months, uh, which has impacted businesses, insurers, underwriting agencies, reinsurance, and prompted government intervention around the world. To help us understand what the cyber threat landscape looks like and help us focus on what the real cyber risk issues are from an Australian perspective, we are delighted to welcome back Peter First, 
who was a popular debut speaker at our last webinar. Peter is one of our cyber breach coaches. He is at the coal face of the emergence incident response solution. When your client needs immediate help, Peter will be one of the team who picks up that initial call for help. Peter is a solicitor and former business owner and brings the experience of both to provide an empathetic and effective service to our insureds. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Jerry, and thank you everyone for joining us today. As mentioned, I just want to give you a quick overview of the, in the uh, risk landscape that we're looking at at the moment. Looking at the current threat landscape, ransomware is what you're going to be hearing a lot about. Uh, this weekend, so it's, it's been a little bit quiet over the, the last few weeks. It was a busy month in October, but we're expecting this weekend, the FBI just overnight has put out a threat warning because they're expecting the combination of Thanksgiving in the United States happening Thursday, and the fact that everyone closes down there for the weekend, plus the Black Friday and the, and the following sales on the Monday means there's a huge spike in internet activity and uh, commercial activity, and it's a great opportunity for threat actors to take advantage of that. So I'm gonna be looking at ransomware, and also I'm gonna be looking at fraud. Okay, so last month, the government released its ransomware action plan. Uh, one of several governments are looking to try and get on top of the threat that is ransomware. A, a number of interesting stats were in this report. Firstly, globally, a ransomware attack occurs every 11 seconds. This is estimated will cost 20 billion US dollars in this year. That, that adds up to about $850 per second which to put that in context is like if you spent a dollar of every second of every minute of every hour of every day, it would take you about 850 years to equal that amount that's lost in this year alone. And just in Australia, there's seen a 15% increase over the past 12 months of ransomwares that have been reported to the, uh, the ACSC, the Cyber Security Centre. Now, the government's response to the threat of ransomware is basically three pronged. The first is looking at prevention and preparation. So things that can be done to limit the, uh, the, the likelihood of ransomware attacks occurring. So a lot of that is awareness campaigns to business, information sharing, and this is particularly between different countries, and then also providing business advice. They've got a lot of tools they've put up on that uh, cyber.gov.au website that businesses can look at to help them be prepared against the threat of ransomware. The second prong is how to respond and recover from an actual attack. So they want to allocate further funds to policing bodies so they're able to better investigate and also to actually seize ransoms. We've seen recently some success in governments actually being able to reclaim uh, Bitcoin. So the US has done it a number of times successfully. So we're looking at increasing our capabilities to do that. They're also looking about mandating reporting, which I'll discuss a little bit further in a moment. But finally, the third prong is to disrupt and deter. This is further yeah, improved capabilities for businesses and funding for those education programs so they can know how to be better prepared. Looking at new penalties that can actually address it as a crime. Uh, international cooperation, which we'll look at in a moment, and then actually being quite proactive in naming and shaming not only entities, but also governments that turn a blind eye to ransomware threat actors. And then finally, looking about how we can try and take control of cryptocurrency in a way that we can stop the threat actors getting that money out once they've received ransoms. Now, as I said, mandatory reporting is one of the key recommendations that they're putting forward. Now, this is a bit watered down from what the Labor government tried to introduce. So what they're suggesting is for businesses that have a $10 million annual turnover, they would need to notify if they've fallen victim to a ransomware attack. Uh, they wouldn't need to notify whether they've actually paid though. So that's a, a bit different than the Labor policy. They've also looked at creating a new offence specifically of cyber extortion. I mean, one of the problem with these offences, of course, is that the threat actors are usually operating out of countries where there is no extradition treaty, and so it's very hard to, to prosecute. But they're also looking at an aggravated assault, uh, aggra aggravated offence of critical infrastructure, basically a, a more severe penalty if you're attacking critical infrastructure. As I say, there's been a lot of international cooperation in trying to address ransomware. So the White House invited 
countries from all around the world to get together last month to discuss this. Of course, being COVID age, this all had to happen in a Zoom meeting. Uh, now, the big problem with this initiative is there are two specific countries that didn't turn up, and that's Russia and China, the two largest state supporters of ransomware. So without them, it's, it's a problem about how much can that actually achieve. Uh, looking at some of the reports that have come out of the US, the uh, US Treasury just did a, an examination into ransomware payments, and they found over the past decade, $2.5 billion of Bitcoin transactions related specifically to ransomware. And this is just related to the 10 most common ransomware variants. So it gives an idea of the kind of cash that's there. Concerning, they found that in the first six months of this year already, there's over 10% of that. So it gives an indication of how much of a threat this is growing. Also wanted just to talk about fraud with you because as we're becoming a little bit smarter about securing our systems, having things like multi-factor authentication enabled, we're finding a, a real growth in just good old fashioned fraud, trying to dupe people into giving over credentials, transferring money, those kinds of things. I'm sure that you guys have seen plenty of this yourself. I mean, a classic email one here that I got just recently purporting to come from my boss. You know, they've got his name right, they've got the business right, they've got my name right. But we need to teach our staff just to be staff to be a little bit wary, wary of these kinds of things. I think, well, you know, is it is it likely that Troy's actually sending me an email asking for my personal phone number when he pays for me to have a business phone. And then also you look a bit closer, that email address, you know, why would he be sending from fine Len Logan quadruple five? Seems a bit dubious. So you need to be aware of these phishing mails. There's obviously fake addresses like that one which stand out, but you'll see they can be a bit more deceptive. So this looks a lot like my email address, but if you look close, you'll see that insurance is actually spelled incorrectly with an E and an A. We see a lot of that domains registered where they'll register with double V instead of a W, uh, maybe an L instead of an I, and can can get past. Uh, obviously, you can also email, edit email headers. So even though it's coming from another address, when you just look at it in your email as you open it, it looks like it's actually coming from a legitimate address. And then the hardest ones to get around is when there's actually been a business email compromise because then the fraudulent email is being sent from, from within the actual environment. So it is a legit email, but this is where just staff education and being aware of what is the likely behavior and unlikely behavior, and then just putting practices in place. You know, if Troy asks me to send through some money to his bank account, I'm gonna give him a phone call and just ask why and confirm that. And just those simple steps can make a big difference. Been a big rise as well in voice phishing or bishing as some call it. We've had a number of matters that have started with something exactly like this, a phone call where it's, hi, this is Peter from Microsoft. We've detected some malicious activity on your computer. They then say, we really want to help you. What we need you to do is, you know, change these settings or, or download this bit of software. And ultimately it's about handing over control to the threat actor. And this I say on a number of ways, particularly with bigger companies, it's easier to do the, hi, I'm Doug, I'm from your IT team. We've, you know, found this out and people are falling for it. And I say they're falling for these scams because the other things we've put in place like multi-factor and complex passwords make it harder to hack. But this, this human hacking, this social engineering is very effective. And once they've got that access, they can move laterally across the network and, and take down the whole system. Now, this is not limited to the IT one, even though that's what we've seen recently a lot. You get charity scams, you know, people saying they're from the Red Cross or from Oxfam, debt collector scams and the seemingly ubiquitous ATO scam that tells us that we're going to jail if we don't pay our back taxes now. I've also seen a big rise in SMS scams. I don't know about you guys, but I seem to get about one of these a week telling me that, you know, there's a new parcel from DHL or Australia Post. Again, they're going to click you on a link. They're going to end up looking like a normal website where you have to log in, but it's just harvesting your credentials. And this is a new one for me. I got from a friend on Instagram. So Sharon's messaging going, hey, I'm like, Hmm, how are you going? Where are you these days? The, the last time I saw Sharon was in Beijing a, a couple of years ago. Yeah, long story. I need you to help me with something. Sure, happy to help. And this is where you start to get a bit suspicious. I'm trying to forward payment to someone and I've hit my daily limit from the bank. Can, can I, you know, can you send it and I'll lend it to me? Yeah, I need your help. And once it's through, I'll be able to pay you back. Yeah, no way. So I'm like, yeah, I've just, I work in cybersecurity law now. Have, have a good day, happy hacking. You've just got to be aware of these things. Now, finally, I just wanted to wrap up by bringing you a little bit up to date on what I've mentioned before, some Privacy Act uh, 
changes are being considered. So last month also the government released their discussion paper into it. Uh, the feedback for this is due on the 10th of January and this will be the end of this uh, review process. They'll produce their final report. But the things that they're looking at, I guess the most important one for all of us is the removal of exemptions, particularly the small uh, business exemption. So as a lot of you may know, uh, you don't always have to make notifications if there's been a Privacy Act breach and the business has a turnover less than $3 million. They're also looking at basically broadening the powers of the, uh, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner to issue penalties. Right now, they can really only do it for serious and repeat offences. So they're looking at having for a lower tier clients to be able to do. And then as we discussed a bit, just trying to create uh, a statutory tort of privacy or a direct right of action, a, a mechanism in which those whose privacy has been compromised are able to seek some recourse for that. That's just a quick wrap up. Sorry, it's so much information in such a short time. Any questions, just jot them through to Troy and we can discuss it in the last 10 minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That gives us um, a very good understanding as to what's happening from a cyber threat perspective. Um, it's also good to understand what's happening from the regulatory landscape um, and how that's changing. If the government is successful in legislating the removal of the small business exemption Peter was mentioning, um, that will have a dramatic impact on approximately 2.9 million um, SMEs in Australia. So that will be a material impact. So um, 12 months ago, we made a decision to do what no other cyber insurer or underwriting agency had done in Australia. And that was to bring the management of the cyber incident response and claims management in-house. This was a bold move by us, but I think it's one of the best things Emergence has done over the last seven years. Personally, I think the timing was also good because the dramatic escalation of cyber events and their severity has provided us with greater ability to control the claims costs, which is now benefiting Emergence from a loss ratio perspective and for our insureds from a responsiveness and cost perspective. To understand how it's gone and the lessons learned, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Blake Baxter. Blake has more than nine years experience in cyber insurance and extensive experience building and managing incident response and claims handling functions, both here in Australia and the United Kingdom. It's been a big year for Blake because not only has he overseen the new incident response solution, he's also the proud father of twins Vance and Lydia, who safely arrived in August. So big time for Blake. Over to you, mate. Excellent. Thank you, Jerry. And good afternoon to all those watching and listening uh, today. So today I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, well, the last four months of claims and incident response uh, at Emergence. Firstly, I'll recap uh, what our incident response and claims offering is. Uh, I'll then discuss the benefits of Emergence's uh, distinct in-house offering, uh, and then go on to discuss the key learnings and takeouts of the past 12 months. Uh, finally, I'll finish up with a, a claims example. Now, as, as Jerry mentioned, and as some of you may be aware, uh, in November 2020, um, at Emergence, we launched, launched Australia's first in-house incident response team uh, for an insurer or underwriting agency. Uh, the purpose of this was to provide enhanced response to our policyholders. Our policyholders have 24-7 access uh, to an Emergence cyber breach coach. Our CBCs, uh, for short, uh, will provide immediate assistance to a policyholder when they require. The cyber breach coach will manage and coordinate the response to the incident. The breach coach will be involved from the outset right through to the resolution of the matter. As well as launching uh, Australia's first in-house incident response team uh, in November 2020, we also brought the claims handling function back in-house. 
Now, this was an important move for emergence uh, and is in line with emergence being a specialist in cyber insurance. We recognise the importance of having experts in the area and that applies to claims handling as well. Cyber claims handling is unlike a lot of other lines of insurance. The time pressure and often the complexity of the event is different to other types of insurance claims. That's why we recognise the importance of having claims handlers who focus exclusively on cyber claims. I'll move on now to the uh, talk a bit about the, the benefits uh, of the our instant response offering uh, and the cyber breach uh, breach coaches that we have. So there are there are a number of um, uh, of benefits to utilising the services of an emergent cyber breach coach. Um, I do note uh, that it is not mandatory to use an emergent uh, cyber breach coach, though we do strongly recommend our insurers to utilise this service um, if they have a cyber event or, or also even if they suspect that they may be suffering some form of cyber event. So the first benefit I'd like to talk uh, a bit about is uh, at no cost. Uh, importantly, the services of our in-house cyber breach coaches does not cost the policyholder, nor does it erode the policy limit. Uh, other insurers or underwriting agencies in the cyber market, they will charge for the time and work of their cyber breach coaches, or what is often called the incident response manager. At emergence, there is no cost. So this means that if a policyholder suspects there may be a cyber event and they require assistance or advice from our cyber breach coaches, um, our breach coaches are able to provide that free of charge, even if there is an excess in place. Whilst other insurers, with other insurers, those initial costs would be the responsibility of the insured as it would be within the excess. We see this as an important and distinguishing aspect of the emergence incident response, response offering. Ultimately, we want our policyholders to come to us if they need assistance, and this aspect of our offering can help our policyholders take comfort that they will not be charged for the time and work of our cyber breach coaches, nor will that time and work actually erode the policy limit. Uh, now, emergence, the emergency response offering it provides a 24-7 service, and that's uh, quite important in the, the cyber space. A, a threat actor can, can strike it at any time. So we manage the hotline number uh, that our insured or brokers contact. So this mean the, means the call goes straight through to an emergent cyber breach coach. Uh, that means immediate assistance can be provided to our policyholders when they need it. Uh, there's no talking to call centres or being passed uh, out from, from or around to various parties. Your call will come straight to our cyber breach coaches, uh, one of them, Peter, who spoke uh, earlier. And, and from there, they'll be able to commence the response to the cyber event that the caller is suffering. Having a, an in house incident response offering also now means that we have that in house cyber security uh, expertise. So, our cyber breach coaches, they have real world incident response experience, uh, they have a broad knowledge of privacy obligations, and they have a comprehensive understanding of the risk posed by threat actors. Over the, over the past year, our breach coaches have dealt with hundreds of calls through our, to our hotline and managed coordinated uh, incident response for a significant amount of cyber events. This experience means that we are able to provide expert response to all sorts of cyber events and understand what the best strategy and approach should be. As Peter mentioned earlier, the, the type of claims and examples we're seeing, um, it's constantly varying and, and being on top of what's happening is quite important. With uh, often uh, how an incident is responded to in the first 24 to 48 hours uh, will dictate the ongoing severity of the issue uh, and the impact to the to the business. So that means the quality of the initial response is crucial at these early stages. When an insured has a cyber event, we encourage them to immediately contact our incident response hotline. And this is where we can begin to provide immediate support and response and then bring in necessary experts uh, such as IT forensics. Another key aspect is, is really around the pre and the post loss services that our incident response team is able to offer. Um, from a pre-loss perspective, our claims and breach coaches can meet with policyholders to discuss incident response plans, uh, discuss the claims process and the incident response process. Further, we often find it, it useful for some of our larger clients to meet with specific uh, emergent spenders, uh, particularly IT forensics and legal, so that everyone really knows 
the, in a case of an event, uh, how it would be operate and who would be the people essentially on the front line. Our involvement, it doesn't cease when the matter is finalised. Our in-depth expertise means that we're in a position to help the insured take steps to try to prevent an attack happening again. So we can share lessons uh, that have been learnt so that practical and, and often inexpensive actions can be taken to assist the insured. Um, this can often be simple uh, tasks or matters such as data retention policies or multi-factor authentication. We can also help uh, the policyholder um, to coordinate um, meeting with appropriate companies that can help them improve their cybersecurity posture. Move on to the, uh, the next slide. Um, the, this slide here up to the top left, that shows our, our hotline number and our email address. Uh, we always recommend that if an incident is a live event, uh, then the insured and or the broker, they call the hotline uh, and that will enable immediate assistance. There's also a, an email address there uh, if, you, if you need. As you can see from the right hand side of this slide, the cyber breach coach really sits at the centre of the incident response offering. Uh, however, there are important uh, other key important players in the process, most of them being emergence panel vendors. Uh, emergence is aligned with uh, the best cyber security experts in their respective fields. So we have an expert panel, panel of vendors. Uh, this includes IT forensics, legal, um, public relations, credit monitoring, and call centres uh, amongst others. We find that using the best companies to help in an instant response is critical in the overall effectiveness of that response. You will note that um, existing IT vendors or, or managed service providers, uh, MSPs for short, can have a crucial role to play in instant response. So we don't necessarily want to replace uh, an existing uh, MSP, but rather we want to supplement their knowledge and work by bringing in specific uh, experts who deal with these type of matters all the times. So this is especially relevant, we find with, with ransomware attacks. Sorry, I'll come on now to the uh, some of the key learnings uh, that we've taken out of the, the last 12 months. So the, the immediate incident response. So it's, it's crucial that, that when a cyber event occurs, that immediate incident response is provided. We've found that the sooner response begins, the greater the chance of minimising the overall impact of the event. Where we have seen companies go wrong is where they have not immediately told us of the event. So this may be because they did not fully understand the severity um, and impacts of the attacks, or that they relied perhaps too much on their existing MSP. So whilst we've seen scenarios where the insured um, believe they had the matter under control, uh, it often transpires that the matter is a lot more complex than they may have initially thought uh, and is actually not resolved. And at times, by the time emergence is advised of this matter, it could be weeks later. Um, by that stage, key logs and forens forensics evidence could have been lost. Uh, and importantly, the operational impact on the business uh, it may have been avoided. Also, I think it's important what, what we have learned is that um, instant response is only as good as the people leading it uh, and the vendors involved. So that's why Emergent were partnered with uh, experts uh, in the area. As, a, as mentioned earlier, that includes the IT forensics, uh, legal, PR, uh, amongst others. So with those vendors, it's, it's also important um, that they also have the geographic reach throughout Australia and the broader Asia Pacific region. As I mentioned earlier, we have found that, that where companies have relied exclusively on their existing MSPs, the, the effectiveness of the response to the cyber event can have varying levels of success. Um, at times we've seen uh, inadequate uh, incident response from ex existing IT vendors. Uh, this is often because they do not have the required expertise uh, or resources to adequately respond, or they may actually have a vested interest in covering the extent of the attack. What we've found as well is that really the severity of attacks has increased significantly, especially over the last six to nine months. Um, from where we were in November 20 to where we are today, the size and complexity of the attacks have definitely increased. Um, ransomware variants have become a lot more sophisticated. Uh, threat actors are exfiltrating more data and key operating systems are being targeted uh, to really impact the uh, ability of a company to, to trade or operate. Uh, 
Um, with ransomware, what we've also seen is the evolution um, of that. And it's, it's not just now about um, impacting the ability of a company to operate, but also what threat actors are doing are exfiltrating data. So this leads to what we call a, a double extortion attack. Um, this is where there can be extortion on the systems which are encrypted, uh, but then there's also a second extortion involving the data that has been exfiltrated uh, and is threatened uh, to be released. So we have seen threat actors target confidential information such as intellectual property uh, in order to try to extort the company. A key aspect uh, we have learned um, we have learned is the value and benefits of having expert in-house claims handling. So as we mentioned, at Emergence, our claims handlers focus solely on cyber claims. So this enables them to become experts in the policy uh, and around the type of claims that we see. So we recognise that it's important for brokers um, and insurers to have clarity about how the policy responds and what is or is not covered. So the nature of, of claims handling for cyber, it's, it's more fast paced it's, uh, than, than other lines of business. So getting out that indemnity position quickly and, and providing clarity uh, to brokers uh, is, is crucial. Now, it's not, uh, there is good news, so it's not all doom and, and gloom um, out there either. So we have found that many attacks are preventable uh, and in a way that's, that's good news. Um, there are a lot of companies uh, are taking proactive measures which will minimise the chance of attack and if an attack does occur, it will minimise the severity of that attack. So our experience over the past 12 months is that a significant proportion of claims could have been avoided if simple security measures were put in place, especially multi-factor authentic authentication, so MFA. Business email compromise or hacking is a particular type of claim that can be reduced if MSA, MFA is in place. In most places where an email account has been accessed, it is because there was no MFA in place. We've found that companies are really, they're starting to realise that simple, and, and these are often relatively cheap measures, uh, can help to protect them. Of course, that alone cannot stop an attack, but it does go a long way to preventing a lot of the, the attempted, uh, all the attacks that we, we do see. Where um, uh, PII or personally identifiable information uh, has been compromised from the hacking event, we found that a lot of the time mailboxes were just holding on to an inappropriate and excessive amount of data. So that meant that um, the threat actor had access significantly more data than would have occurred if, if adequate data retention policies were in place. At times, we've seen mailboxes compromised uh, that has data and emails going back over a decade. Um, if that data gets compromised, then a significant uh, e-discovery process needs to occur and the amount of impacted parties can be significant. Um, what, what is important, and, and we are seeing more of it now, is um, a data, better data retention policies around email accounts um, that limits the amount of information and type of information that is stored within an email account. So that means if a business email compromise uh, does occur, the amount of potentially uh, accessed or exfiltrated data is limited. And that helps to keep claims costs down. Um, it also protects the company's intellectual property um, and it also reduces the amount of parties that may need to be notified. Now, finally, um, in respect to the, the key learnings what we've, we've taken out of the last 12 months, and I'll, I'll touch on this with my uh, claims example to finish off, um, is that third party claims under cyber policies are beginning to increase. Uh, these are claims often related to a cyber event suffered by an insured uh, that results in a loss to a third party. So that, that third party, they may then bring legal proceedings against the insured who suffered, um, who actually suffered the cyber event. In those circumstances, uh, the policy can look to respond by defending that claim uh, and also cover any loss arising from judgments, awards um, or settlements and the like. So for those of you who have attended uh, previous um, emergence webinars, you'll know that we, we like to talk uh, and at least have a claims example in, in every uh, webinar, and, and that's to really show how the policy works in real world uh, situations. In prior webinars, we've talked of claims that involve a first party aspect. So that is, we're covering cyber event re response costs, uh, often IT forensics, um, legal costs, et cetera, of responding to a cyber event. 
this is uh, covered under Section C of the policy. However, there is a lot more to the emergent cyber policy than just cyber event response costs, and I'd like to discuss a recent claim that demonstrates that. So firstly, though, in, in regards to the emergence of policy, I just want to give a brief overview of the other sections uh, of the policy, including the section that's relevant for today's claims example. So for those uh, who are not familiar or haven't necessarily seen these coverage sections, uh, section A is losses to your business. So this is for the impact of business costs um, caused by a cyber event. So in other words, it's about business interruption. It looks at covering the lost profits during during an indemnity period that was directly caused by a cyber event. This can be particularly relevant with ransomware, where an insured systems have been shut down and they are unable to trade. Um, if this has occurred, then it may be appropriate for emergence to appoint a forensic accountant to assess the impact on business costs. We then have section B of the policy. Uh, this is lost to others. This is for third party claims against an insured either from a multimedia injury or because of a cyber event in the insurer's business. The policy will defend uh, the claim covering defence costs uh, and any other loss such as awards, judgments or settlements. Uh, the example I'll talk about shortly will involve this section of the policy. Uh, we then have section C of the policy. Um, as I mentioned, this is the most common uh, uh, part of the policy where claims costs are covered under. It's, it's the cost of IT forensics, legals, etc., to for responding to the event. Uh, finally, the section D of the policy, and that's the optional cover. So this is a cover for social engineer theft, uh, cyber theft, or, or tangible property being the main acts, aspects of this cover. Uh, socially engineered theft and cyber theft is about the direct financial loss uh, suffered by the insured. Now onto the actual claims example uh, itself. So uh, the example today was a mid, it's a mid-sized building contractor um, and the company suffered a, a business email compromise or a hacking type event. So, so this is where the threat actor accesses the mailbox of a company. Uh, often the motivation around this may be to extract data or, or to attempt some kind of financial fraud such as social engineer theft uh, on the insured or on some other, some other party uh, or to conduct cyber theft. In this matter, the threat actor had accessed and they had control of the email account of the accounts employee uh, of the insured. So the threat actor here, they began to send emails from, um, from that uh, account to various parties. So the insured uh, became aware of this incident when one of the recipients uh, of that email alerted the insured and suspected that something was, uh, was questionable on it. Uh, at this point, uh, the insured contacted the incident response hotline uh, and we provided immediate assistance from there. So in most ways, this was a relatively straightforward hacking event. Uh, containment was achieved by, by, our, by our IT forensics vendor quite quickly. Um, and it was also confirmed there was no data exfiltration, thus no notification obligations. So where this became an issue, um, was around a third party, so a subcontractor of the insured. They'd received an email from the insured, uh, but it, from the insured's email account, but it was actually sent by the threat actor. Uh, as it came from the legitimate email account, uh, this third party, um, so the subcontractor, it followed the instructions um, within that email to pay the supplier uh, for works on the project. Um, the subcontractor ultimately paid $52,000 to the fraudulent party. The subcontractor here, they held the insured responsible for their loss. They said this was uh, this, so this was not a loss suffered by the insured, but it was the subcontractor or, or the third party who'd suffered the loss. But the third party held the insured responsible as it was insured who'd suffered the cyber event, i.e. the hacking incident. So the third party engaged the solicitor. Um, they sent a, let, sent a letter of demand to the insured and they threatened to commence the legal proceedings. So at this point, the letter of demand constituted a claim under the policy, and the policy was able to respond by providing defence cover to the insured. Uh, so this was because the allegations directly linked uh, to a cyber event uh, suffered by the insured. We engaged one of our panel law firms to defend the claim, um, and so within the scope of the policy, we, we'd pick up defence cover or any other loss uh, that was to be suffered, such as settlement awards or judgments. Ultimately, this matter was resolved without the matter escalating to legal proceedings, which was the good news. Um, a number of defences were raised, which would have been strong had the matter gone to court. Um, 
But actually what, what it resolved this was after some further work, it was determined that the third party financial institution was actually still looking to recover the payment, which was ultimately successful. So at that point, the third party actually hadn't suffered a loss and the matter was resolved. However, what this does show is an example of how a claim could arise and, and does arise um, and would have been continued to be pursued if the money hadn't been recovered. So situations like this, it, it can put a big burden on it to insure, especially when legal proceedings are threatened uh, to be commenced or actually do, do commence. So I think this is where the policy um, really can provide some, some assistance in preventing that claim and really helping uh, the insured out. Now, just onto the, the final slide, I'll just show you um, this quickly. This is just the extract of the, the insuring clause and the relevant definitions under section B, lost to others. Now that finalises my segment for today. So I'll thank you all and I'll pass you back across to Jerry. Thanks, Blake. That gives us a good understanding of what the benefits of um, managing the entire process of the claim is. So um, what I want to do now is um, that gives us an understanding of um, the claim scenario. What I want to do now is look at the, the um, other side of how claims are managed um, and see, uh, take the bigger picture of how the cyber insurance industry has fared recently from a lost ratio perspective and um, share how the emergence portfolio has performed over time. To help us with this is one of the few men who can beat me in a talking competition. And for those of you who know me, that's a big feat. So I'd like to welcome you to the mad American, Jeff Gonlan. He is our head of underwriting and product development. Before joining Emergence thousands of years ago, Jeff was Genry's regional chief underwriter for all casualty, facultative and program business across the Asia Pacific region. He's also been the architect of the last five Emergence commercial policy wordings and the brains behind the Emergence personal cyber policy wording. I'll hand you over to the man that we fondly call the Godfather. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, welcome everyone there in cyber world. Uh, we're going to look at some of the claims that we've got on our book and uh, how they compare. You know, are they uh, unique? Uh, are they just part of a larger trend? Uh, you know, if you tuned in last year in November, uh, we did a similar sort of exercise. Uh, you know, there's there's plenty of data out there, plenty of information and reports on data breaches and security and so forth. Uh, uh, fortunately or or unfortunately, I think it's that's a statement right there as to uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, let's get started. Okay, we'll look at the um, uh, the first slide. There we go. So, you know, uh, the cyber market, uh, cyber used to be hard to sell, and now it's actually gone to where it's hard to buy. So what, what's happened? What's happened is an awful lot of red ink. Uh, we'll start with the, uh, the biggest cyber market, which is the U.S., which is roughly, call, call it $3 billion. S&P, the Standard & Poor's, put out a, a global market intelligence report on the, um, uh, uh, the results uh, companies filed. Loss ratios rose for the third straight year, climbing 25 percentage points to an average of 72.8%. That's a loss ratio. You add expenses, on average, nobody's making money. Uh, Moody's, uh, looks. They, they say it looks like it's going to get worse in 2021. Uh, they're citing uh, increases in, in severity of ransomware attacks. AM Best took a four-year perspective. Average growth in premium, up 20%. I think we could identify with that. What happened to claims? Up nearly twice that, 39%. So obviously not sustainable. Uh, if you look at the 15 of the 20 largest cyber insurers, uh, red ink, uh, loss ratios rising. I'll give you a couple of selected numbers. Uh, I'm not going to name the companies here. You, you can look that up if you're interested, but 
82 percent, 98.2 percent, 101 and 114 percent. Those are loss ratios, not combined ratios. And you know we're not making any money on uh, investment income these days, so it, it really comes down to underwriting. So there, there's a lot of uh, money that's being lost, not just in, in the States. Uh, I was reading an article by Fitch the other day. Uh, in Canada, 66 percent or 66 points jump in the claims ratio to 105 uh, percent. I'm not going to tell you about Australia. You, you, you guys are here. So what's clear is underwriters are losing a lot of money. So what's what's behind that? Let's look at where who's having a claims and where. Uh, Accenture put out a report, the uh, CIFR uh, report uh, that was in uh, mid 2021, I think, a triple digit increase in cyber attacks. Now, why I was interested in, in Accenture is they're not in insurance per se, uh, and most companies don't have cyber insurance. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm curious as to how, you know, what, what they're seeing, uh, how their experience is run, uh, should, should give us a, a, you know, a different angle on this. Global incident volume up 125%. Oh my God, across the board. What are they seeing by, by industry? Industry by industry, it, you know, I can identify with what they're reporting there. 21, 29% consumer goods and services. Yep, industrial, spot on. Well, we don't do a lot of big banks. So uh, surpri not surprisingly, we, we, we don't have uh, experience there. Travel and hospitality. We have an Australian book. We've been in lockdown for, I don't know, forever. Uh, Insurance, we, t we toss a little bit of uh, financial in there, uh, but it's, it's mainly insurance, uh, eight to nine percent. So, it, it, you know, I can identify with that. Um, what kind of grabbed my attention though, is if you look at that that uh, graph to the right there, uh, Australia in third place. If you, you, you go by per capita, Australia must be number one as far as uh, cyber incidents. You know, last I looked, uh, Germany was uh, about four times as big as um, um, Australia. Uh, the U.S. is something like 15 times the size of Australia. So, uh, you know, what, what's wrong with that? With that? With that uh, picture? Perhaps it, that shows more about uh, the Accenture client base. I'm not sure. Is it really so bad in Oz? That got me thinking. Well, again, there are plenty of reports out there. Checkpoint put out a mid-year report, uh, report, so covering roughly the same period there. Uh, they split it out geographically too, which, which was interesting. Asia Pacific, they said, is, is up 13% for cyber attacks. You look at the ACSC, cybercrime in Australia, up nearly 13%. Um, do we have a, are, are we seeing increased frequency, you know, 125% increase? No, no, we're not. Uh, frequency to me looks like it's more or less stable. What's driving our losses is severity. Well, are there any reports on that? IBM puts out a great report. Uh, they do really good work there. They, uh, IBM uh, put them in cost of data breach. Uh, they have an Australia specific version. Uh, they're claiming it's up 30.2%. Uh, and another statistic that they, they put out there, average claim severity increased by 31% year on year and tripled since 2017. I look back and I says, how does that compare with ours? I says, oh my God. Well, um, uh, pretty similar. We're seeing the same things there. Everybody's talking about ransomware. If that's the big driver, what can we say about ransomware? Uh, Department of Home Security, uh, the, the secretary there said, overall, they've been up almost 300% in the past year. As a matter of fact, small businesses comprise a half to three fourths of the victims of ransomware. You know, on the one hand, we're seeing uh, bigger targets or bigger companies being targeted because that's that's where the money is, right? On the other hand, uh, it doesn't come to revenue per se. It really comes down to the willingness of a company to pay the ransom. So, you know, the smaller companies, uh, mid-sized companies, if they're willing to pay, maybe they're easier targets. And you know what? They don't have the same security. So that's why we're seeing that, I think. Checkpoint, uh, again, they, they looked at um, ransomware first half 2021, up 93% overall. That'd be a global statistic. 19% in Asia Pacific and ACSC, I think Peter mentioned this earlier, only up 15%. So is this like a US, maybe Europe type of problem and, you know, it's not affecting Australia? Uh, maybe we're lucky. I think part of it is we've, we've been, we've been darn lucky, but 
it does show up in our stats. It's our second highest uh, you know, type of incident, 31% of them. That's about what uh, Accenture was reporting as well, so not that different. Um, looking at the severity, uh, you know, I, I, I found this uh, uh, quite interesting what, what CrowdStrike did. Uh, they took a 2020 Australia specific survey and uh, they reported the amount, average amount for the ransom was uh, one and a quarter million. Uh, Palo Alto, you know, they also uh, did a report. Uh, there's a more global report there, so that, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the demands versus what's paid. The demands there uh, look like that's more or less in line with, uh, you know, the Australian uh, number there. As far as paid, uh, what I think is is of interest there is, uh, of course, the paid is a little bit less. You don't, you know, you don't you don't pay more than than is demanded, of course, and, and some don't pay at all, but. What is uh, uh, really shocking there is look at 19 versus uh, 20, 171% increase year on year. And 2021 uh, is, uh, I think, shaping up to be equally bad. What's our experience shown? I looked at the 2020 ransomware claims. We're up 155%. Again, your mileage may vary, but I think I know what direction it's going in. Uh, there was a report by the uh, CSCRC. They're calling it the trillion dollar uh, problem that, that we've got, uh, citing not just uh, insurance costs, most of it's not insured, looking at business interruption, just the impact overall. Uh, they're calling it the trillion dollar problem that we've got. It's it's really just a perfect uh, perfect business model or <laughs> for, for the crooks. Uh, on the lighter side, uh, let's look at business email compromise. That's actually our number one claim. The ACSC says, you know, Australian businesses are losing a lot of money. Uh, their top cybercrime category. Yep, would agree with that. Tick, that's the frequency. How about severity? Is there an issue there? Well, they publish numbers on this, so I compared it against our own. Um, it seems like when it comes to business email compromise, you know, that, that uh, you know, the doctored invoice and so forth. Um, well, one crook's as good or as as bad as another. Financially motivated, uh, you know, it depends on what they, uh, on what the um, the uh, you know typical commercial transactions are. So, uh, we're actually right. Uh, I was surprised at how close this came in. We're we're about a thousand bucks off on that, but uh, call it equal. Um, interestingly, you know, they have a, a, a much bigger sample size than we do. They're reporting uh, an increase in severity. What they're seeing for 2021 of uh, just over 50 grand. Should we expect that on our book? Yeah, I think probably so. Now, let's look at BEC versus ransomware, you know, number one versus number two. BEC hurts, uh, you know, nobody likes to lose money. You know, gee, I feel stupid, I got duped into, you know, transferring that, but ransomware can kill. This is the common cold versus COVID. You know, the financial, reputational, operational, there's just no comparison. Uh, what do they have in common though? Uh, we've seen a lot of it, and I think we know how to mitigate it. Uh, the question is, how do you get companies to do that? Um, Cybercrime is global, you know, knows no boundaries, etc. Uh, it's super lucrative. Now, here's the silver lining. With so much common IT, because people are people, uh, lessons from losses actually transfer much faster and more readily on cyber, I think, than any other line of business. Here's a couple of non-quantitative things that, that I've picked up. Uh, Australians are not adapting fast enough. you got to run faster. You know, didn't you know cyber is dynamic? Uh, state of the art, state of the art of attack. Um, it's not just more ransomware, it's more sophisticated. You know, you've got to be improving your security uh, every year, continuously, year after year, or you're falling behind. It's a red queen race. I, I kind of misquoted her there. Sorry about that, but you know, you get the idea. Um, cost of a cyber event can vary considerably, and we talked a lot about averages in here. What's interesting to me isn't the average, it's the variance in that. Why does one claim cost half as much, another cost twice as much? Well, uh, a couple of things that uh, uh, I think Blake had mentioned, the data. Uh, know your data. Data is an asset and a liability. Data drives uh, claim costs. Um, as far as um, plans, if you don't have one, get one. If you have one, you know what? Test it. 
do a red team, blue team sort of thing. Caution, this requires management buy-in and you know commitment. Uh, they've, they've actually got to do something, so that might be difficult. Uh, I've been, um, been been kind of following the uh, technical solutions, and uh, you know we get a whole new alphabet soup out there. Is are they effective? Are they not effective? You know the uh, security automation, EDR, XDR. Uh, IBM had some stats on this, and I I found this really striking. Security automation. When you get the you know the uh, the new uh, EDR and XDR type stuff in there uh, that responds automatically, um, it can make an 80% difference in. Uh, the outcome. Faster discovery, faster containment. Uh, I'm just about out of time, so I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm probably over. Sorry, Jerry. I'm, I'm going to stop there. What we do know is good practice transfers, uh, and the good news is we know what works. Every loss is an opportunity to learn. There you go. Jerry, back to you. Thank you, Jeff. Entertaining as always. So um, that gives you uh, an insight as to uh, what's, uh, what's happening in the emergence portfolio. What I want to do now is talk about what's happening at emergence. So since our last webinar, we've been busy hiring people, improving the broker experience and renewing our facilities. So firstly, um, we recently appointed experienced insurance and cyber specialist Colin Posey as our chief operating officer. Colin has more than four decades of legal and commercial insurance experience and for the last seven years was a consultant with Spark Helmore Lawyers establishing its cyber insurance practice. He's been part of the emergence journey since its beginning as an external legal advisor assisting with the development of the emergence wordings. Prior to that, Colin managed underwriting agencies, including day-to-day -day oversight of all major functions of the businesses. Now, whilst we welcome all of Colin's knowledge and experience, it just puts further pressure on Jeff and I as the best talkers in emergence because uh, Colin is very gifted in that side of things as well. So we've also invested heavily in technology to improve the credit control side of the business. Melina Perfect Policia has been very busy in the background working with our technology partners to roll out a new AI enabled account collection and reconciliation system. The solution allows for our team to focus on exception based reporting and reducing manual processes and decision making time. So all this is about making sure that the remittances from you are reconciled more quickly and any outstanding premiums are dealt with in a more timely manner. To help us with the reconciliation, can you please get your accounts team to send their remittances to finance at emergenceinsurance.com.au. Um, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to touch on a few things here about um, how Emergence is supporting you. So one of the important things is we have renewed our binders and we've reconfirmed 100% Lloyd's capacity with no change to capabilities and no change to capacities. We continue to provide 10 million capacity across 13,000 occupations. Um, you also know how we support you from an education perspective, and many of you will know from a coverage perspective, what we do is change our wording every year so that we can keep on top of what's happening from a threat perspective. Um, all the information is available on our website for commercial and personal offering, as well as marketing information and claims information. So um, it's all there for you at emergenceinsurance.com.au. Don't forget, we also released our new personal Cyber Express solution in September, which provides you as brokers with a personal cyber solution on your website with a full electronic payment process built in. 
You can email info at emergenceinsurance.com.au if you want to know more about that. The emergence team has been expanding, as you can see. We've got the largest cyber team in the country now, which we're very proud of. Our incident response team, telephone number is also there um, if you need to contact us. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, everybody's entitled to one CPD point. We will automatically send out the certificates um, to the email address that you registered on. For those of you who are listening as a group, such as in a boardroom, please send a list of attendees now, including full name and email address to info at emergenceinsurance.com.au so that we can issue you with the um, certificate of attendance. So um, I'll, um, I'll open the, um, the cameras and uh, hand over to Troy to see what um, questions we've got for the panel. Sure, thanks Jerry. Um, the first one we have is, and this, this is very common, uh, we hear this a lot from brokers when they're trying to talk to their clients about cyber. Um, so we, we sometimes receive the objection from clients, all our data is, is kept in the cloud, Azure, uh, AWS, etc. Um, so they can't get us with ransomware. Um, what do you guys say, say to that? Yeah, I'll jump in with that one. Uh, in short, cloud computing does provide great security options because of the backup possibilities that you have. So it is a good way to minimize your risk, but it certainly doesn't absolve your risk. There's particularly three ways that we see uh, a ransomware attack spread with a cloud environment. One is it starts on a local device, and then that syncs back to the cloud environment, and that's how the encryption spreads. Uh, the second is if someone is able to directly access your cloud account. This is very common through credential harvesting and, and phishing emails. And again, once they're in there, they've still got access to the data. And then the third way is if there is an actual hack of the provider. Now, I have seen in the past like in the US, a couple of big providers have been taken down. The ones you've mentioned there, particularly Azure, uh, Amazon, Google, they've got very good defense. But even when you've got good defense and good backups, the time it takes to restore from a ransomware attack is significant. Uh, certainly having backups is wonderful. It means that you can recover. It means that you don't have to pay the ransom, uh, but it still doesn't stop you from the time it takes to recover from backups. And as we find quite often, people have untested backups or they're not as recent as they think or one classic matter we had recently where they had an offline backup, someone had just left it plugged in to the USB, and so that was encrypted. So yeah, those, I, I'm a huge believer in cloud-based computing. Us personally in Emergence, like we use Azure, we've got it configured with Microsoft Intune. So right now I can only access our Microsoft account on this specific device. And you know, if I tried using Troy's, I wouldn't be able to access it. So I think that they're, Lots of mechanisms in place that can improve your security posture, but anyone who thinks that they're immune, uh, yeah, is uh, is unfortunately deluding themselves. Thanks, Pete. Troy, we've got time for one more question. We're running a bit over time. Sure. What have you got? Okay, last one. Um, good afternoon. Would Would you mind making comment on how how we or how we brokers? Uh, can assist clients in identifying and assessing their exposure. Um, where do they start? What can they do? And how can we, Emergence, help brokers do that? Uh, Jeff, probably... Can you take that? I'll, uh, I'll jump in there uh, firstly uh, on that, that Troy. Um, so as I mentioned uh, during my presentation, having these in-house instant response resources, um, we, we can um, provide, I guess the, the journey starts really uh, from, from the outset in, in the sense that we've got these resources to help the insured and work with insureds to understand how their business operates, uh, what they may have in place at the moment, do they have an instant response plan, uh, et cetera, and start talking them them through that so we, we can understand should an event occur, uh, how that will work with emergency involvement as, as well. Um, we, we can also then look to actually, um, if they're looking to improve um, 
their cybersecurity posture, then, then look to actually bring in um, uh, some, some entities that can actually help them professionally with that. Um, but we can also provide some certain recommendation. As I said, there's often some, some easy and quick fixes, which would certainly help um, and is a good starting point. And having, uh, having people like Pete at the coalface really uh, helps to be able to provide that information back. Thanks if for me. On the um, if you go to the business.gov.au website and search for something called the Cyber Security Assessment Tool, it's a, uh, a free government service that just gives a, a real quick way for businesses to get some indication of their vulnerabilities. It's not perfect by any means, being you know kind of an automated survey, but it's a good idea. And then if you do look at uh, cyber.gov.au, which is the, the website of the Australian Cyber Security Centre. It has a lot of information on what particularly is called the essential aid, and these are the essential aid steps can be taken to have what it considers to be a minimum standard of cyber security protection. Yeah, so those are two great places to start. Thanks for that, Pete. I'm just mindful of time, everybody. We've run a little bit over time, so I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us today. I hope you've got a greater understanding of the cyber threat landscape and what's happening. If you need access to the emergence portal or you need your password reset, just email info at emergenceinsurance.com.au and we'll be able to take care of that for you. If you um, want to get access to this webinar or all our previous webinars, It'll be posted on YouTube very soon. We'll send you a short survey to gain your feedback on today's webinar, to get your thoughts on the topics that you'd like to see in future webinars. Our next webinar is going to be in February next year. We'll be making another exciting announcement then, so stay tuned for that. We'll send invites out a few weeks beforehand. This is the official end of the webinar. Thank you again for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.